Good, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Truth Baptist Church. It's a chilly day out there, isn't it? Man, I, I mean, I'm just glad that it didn't snow last night, but I'm so glad to see you all here. It's such, such a great morning to have you all here. Um, you know, so many smiling faces. It's great to be together in fellowship and worship the Lord. So let us now stand and we'll worship. We'll turn to 353, 353, victory in Jesus. I heard an old, old story How a Savior came from glory How he gave his life on Calvary To save the wretch like me I heard about his groaning Of his precious blood's atoning Then I repented of my sins And won the victory Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory. On the third, I heard about a mansion he has built for me in glory. And I heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea. About the angels singing and the old redemption story. And some sweet day I'll sing up there the song of victory. Oh, victory, yeah, Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ever I knew him and all my love to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. Amen. Amen. We should never grow tired of, of proclaiming that truth and victory that we have in Jesus Christ. Let us now turn to 495. 495. Jesus loves even me. 495. And we'll sing the first and third verse. I am so glad Jim and tells of his love in the book he has given wonderful things in the Bible I see. This is the dearest that Jesus loves me. I am so glad Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. I am so glad Jesus loves me. Jesus loves even me. Oh, if there's only one song I can sing, when in his beauty I see the great King, this shall my song in eternity be. Oh, what a wonder that Jesus loves me. I am so glad Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves even me. Amen. You know, that is a true statement. It's not just something that sounds good in a song, but it's something true according to God's word. Uh, for God so loved the world. So we can, we can say that God loves everyone. And uh, what a blessing that is to know that the Lord loves us this morning. Amen. And uh, there might not be a lot that we don't know, but we know for a certainty that the Lord loves us. And I'll tell you, that's enough to go another day. Amen. Good to be here today. And uh, we're so thankful to have you here. Uh, we're calling this Vision Sunday. 
usually we have our big vision, uh, our new theme sign out in the lobby, and they didn't measure the grommets for us, so I'm going to blame it on them, you know. But uh, we'll have it up here next Sunday, most likely, but you might have seen it on the screen as you came in. But the, the theme for 2024 is so much the more. So, so much the more in 2024. Now, we might think, Pastor, our new year, we're trying to, like, trim down and not have so much. Well, we're going opposite. We want so much the more, not necessarily in your physicality, but in many other areas spiritually and in our church life. We want so much the more, and uh, we're going to talk about that. And uh, tonight, I hope you'll be back. We'll have a calendar that we'll give out uh, with all the year uh, events and activities and just looking forward to a lot of what the Lord will do for us in 2024. But thank you for being here. Let's pray and let's ask the Lord's blessing on this service. Father, we thank you for this time together today to be here and to consider one another and to consider you. Thank you for loving us. And I do pray that we would understand how that, that truth, that phrase, so much the more applies because every day we live is a day closer to the return of Christ. And every day we live could be a day closer to the day that we leave this life. And so we just ask, Father, that you would help us to remember those things. I pray that you would be with those who might be sick and uh, not able to be here. I know we have a number of folks who are still yeah, in, that, in that place. And, Lord, I also think of people who have some upcoming procedures that are happening. Lord, we think of Gene Alexander, who will be having a, an oblation done uh, tomorrow. And we just lift her up in prayer to you this morning. Uh, we think of Debbie Baggett, who will be having uh, a catheterization and possibly more done on Wednesday. Uh, we also uh, lift up to you Mary White, who is here on the 29th. She'll be having uh, a very important and involved uh, surgery up at UVA. And so there's several, that Lord, that are in need of prayer. Others who are sick, we think of Brother Parisher, and we, Lord, think of the Craigs and others. Uh, who have been sick and uh, just dealing with different things. And we just pray, Lord, that you would be with each one, encourage each heart, and help us to see truth today. We thank you and love you. In Jesus' precious and holy name we pray. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. I'm going to ask our ushers to come to the front. They have in their hand a visitor welcome card and a pen. And we want to welcome you today if you are visiting for the first time. And as they make their way down the aisle, if you're visiting here today, please just raise your hand. We want to get to know you. After the service, my wife Heather and I will be in the lobby, and we would love to have the opportunity to say hello and to get to meet you and uh, learn a little more about you. And uh, I, I just prayed about the Craigs, and I see Meg Craig and Rob Craig back there. It is so good to see you all. They did not drop off the face of the earth, so we are glad to know that. Is everyone healthy? Good. I am so glad. We prayed for little Dougie and his pneumonia and all that was going on there so uh, good to see the Craigs after we just got done thinking of them and praying for them uh, several things to keep in mind I already mentioned it but come back tonight for our vision night we hope you'll be here you might say what's vision night well we simply give a calendar of events for the year and then I'll have a message that'll be brief but it will uh, just kind of give us even uh, a little more about that vision I hope you'll be back for the evening service at six o'clock okay and uh, I know there's all kinds of playoff football and stuff happening. Don't worry about that. Just come out. You'll still have enough time to see the Chiefs win, right? Right? Okay. All right. You'll still have time to see the Chiefs win. I don't know anymore. I don't even pay much attention other than just casually watching it. But anyhow, um, come out tonight. Be here. Uh, we won't be any longer than an hour, Lord willing. And uh, we will have a, a great vision night service together tonight. This morning we'll be preaching on the theme, So Much the More. Uh, let me mention uh, something else if I can. There is now a sign-up sheet on the back table for the sweetheart dinner. So uh, we would love to have you sign up for that. Uh, all of our married couples, or maybe if we have any engaged couples here, I don't know if we have any of those, uh, but we would love for you to sign up for the sweetheart dinner. We're going to be meeting at Anna's Italian uh, Restaurant, or Ristorante, as they say sometimes, uh, and it'll be right here in Mechanicsville. And we did this last year for our sweetheart dinner. We'll do it again. It's really the best place in Mechanicsville for a large group to meet. It really is the only place that has the accommodation for a group our size. So 
uh, I would uh, love to have you sign up, you and your sweetheart. And uh, men, I like to encourage the men to be proactive here, okay? Uh, guys, don't be that guy. And none of us want to be that guy, but we still end up being that guy sometimes. And we say to ourselves, oh, my wife, our wife will sign us up. My wife will sign us up, you know. No, don't you be the one to sign up and say, hey, I'd like to take you out and be with our church family. We usually play a few games. We usually have a little bit of fun. It's just a good time together. This year, Holly Woodward, and she's going to have some minions helping her, uh, has offered to come to the church during the sweetheart dinner and to babysit here. Okay, so that's a, fir that's a first in Truth Baptist history done that way. Now, we've had some different people watching at their homes, but uh, sometimes for couples that have smaller children, the big question is, okay, we're going to have a night out. Who's going to watch all the rugrats, all right? Well, uh, Holly said she would offer to head it up. Now, that doesn't mean she's going to be the only one here. Um, I know I have a couple girls that I'm going to employ for that, all right? And uh, we would like to get others involved. So any teenage girls and maybe young single girls or whoever who would like to help Holly, we want to get as many of you here as possible on that night, Thursday night, February 8th, so that couples with children... Uh, who are not old enough to stay home by themselves can say, all right, we'll come, we'll drop them off at the church. Anna's is right down that way. Just a, it's just a mile down that mile or two down that way. You can get there, come right back when you're done, pick them up, try to make it as easy as we can, all right? We're taking all the excuses out. We're pulling out all the stops, so make it a good night. February 8th, it'll be a great time. Uh, we do not have a menu there put with the sign-up sheet, but we will put it there this week. But as you write your name, they only let us have about four choices to pick from just because with a group that size, they really need to us to only pick from about four different uh, menu items. So write down next to your name what you think you would, the dish that you would most enjoy or like, and we'll get the menu out later and so that you have that. I'm going to ask our ushers to come. Contribution receipts for the year 2023 are in the lobby. They're on that table right there behind the sound booth in the lobby. Please pick yours up. If you are in a household where multiple people are giving in the same household, all those receipts should be in the same envelope. Brother Purcell put those together as our treasurer, so uh, be sure to get that. And uh, if you don't have it, we'll mail them out here before the end of the month. But uh, help us with that by getting that today if you can. Are we got a new usher? That's great. So glad to have John join the fold of the ushers. That's wonderful. Could you pray for us and pray for the offering, please? Thank you. 
Amen. Thank you, Holly. It's not often we get to hear stuff in a minor key signature, but I enjoy personally <laughs> very much. Uh, so now let us continue to worship. Uh, we will turn to 324, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. Uh, 324, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. And then we will have our chorus of the month and greet one another. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my riches gain I God lost and more content. On all my pride, forbid it, Lord, that I should boast, save in the death of Christ my God, all the vain things that charm me. I sacrifice them to his blood. On the fourth, were the whole realm of nature mine, that were the present far too small. Love so My soul, my life, my all. Amen. And now we will sing our chorus of the month. We will greet one another halfway through it. It should be on the back wall as well as in the bulletin. I sing a new song. I sing a new song. a new master, wear a new name, walk a new road, have a new goal, know a new peace, down deep in my soul. Okay, please turn and greet one another.
I sing a new song since Jesus came. Serve a new master, wear a new name, walk a new road, have a new goal, know a new peace down deep in my soul. Amen. Would you take your Bibles, please, and turn with me to Hebrews chapter number 10. Hebrews chapter number 10. We're departing from Matthew for a week as we consider our theme for the year 2024. And we are in a familiar passage of Scripture, but one that is just rich and helpful and that I believe will be perfect for us as we charge ahead in the year that is ahead for us. Again, it's good to see some folks back in church and some people that have been sick and maybe back at it. So good to see the Craigs and good to see Joanne Austin here today and uh, really good to see you and a number of others. So praise the Lord for those who make it out and uh, who are here. <clears throat> but we're in Hebrews 10 and we're going to begin in verse 22. And there the Bible says this. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. I want to really focus on that phrase there at the end of verse 25, although we'll consider all the verses we just read. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. As I was considering, Lord, what would you want us to have as a theme for the year 2024? Uh, really, this came to the forefront for me. And no, it's not just because it rhymes with 2024, although that is helpful. So much the more in 2024. Uh, we want in the year ahead for God's people to say yes to what God wants us to do. And to not say no, I don't think so, I'm going to fall away, I'm going to scale back, but to say, okay, Lord, I'm going to dive in. I'm going to do what you want me to do. I'm going to take on what you would want me to take on. I'm going to jump in and serve uh, as you would want me to do so. And so with this thought, so much the more, I want to apply it, I want to ask God's help with it. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for uh, this time. I pray that it would be encouraging to us. Thank you for loving us. Lord, you have given us everything. And so, from a God who has given us everything, I pray that we would give so much the more. And I pray that we would be involved so much the more. Not so much less, but more. And Lord, I ask that you would give us wisdom about how that looks in our heart and in our lives. I pray that you would uh, show us how we can be more in the Christian life. So we'll ask you for your strength and for your help as we go forward with this. Uh, show us what we need to know. In Jesus' precious and holy name we pray. Amen. The book of Hebrews, first of all, uh, it is a book that tells us that men are to make the coffee, okay? And the reason why is because Hebrews, okay? All right. Anyhow, uh, who makes the coffee in your house? Is it the men? 
Raise your hand if it's the men. Okay, you biblical people. Very good of you. And uh, others of you, maybe it's the women. Do the women make the coffee? Or how about, like in our house, it might be the teenage girl that makes the coffee. All right. <laughs> Very good. Um, but anyhow, Cassie, you make some coffee? Something. Very good. Very good. Uh, but so much the more we find in Hebrews. But Hebrews is a book, aside from being silly, that is uh, written to newly believing Jews, and it's still applicable to God's people today. Now, we must remember something. Newly believing Jews had come out of a now defunct religious system. And these newly believing Jews were now entering into something that was completely foreign to them. Wonderful, yes, but totally and completely different. And we must remember something, not all Jews believed in Jesus Christ, even in the time when Christianity began. Uh, a number of them did, but a good number of them stayed in the old religious system of Judaism. And so Paul, we believe, is the writer of Hebrews, or at least I believe that to be true as you read and consider the writing style. He is writing a very important letter to this newly saved Jewish community. And he's telling them all that is different, and he's reiterating over and again the new and the better way, the new system and the new covenant. And that new way was through and in the person of Jesus Christ. That's still the same for us today if we're God-fearing, uh, God-believing people. That we have access to God the Father through his son, Jesus Christ. And we can have a home in heaven because of Jesus Christ and because he shed his blood for us and so on and so forth. But understand, that was very different to those who were just recently saved and had come to place their faith in Jesus. And all throughout Judea and the surrounding areas were still Jewish synagogues. And especially after... Jesus had ascended back into heaven, uh, there was a strong push in those Jewish synagogues, no doubt, to bring maybe some of these wayward uh, Jews back into the fold and to try to pull them back into that old, defunct religious system of the ceremonial law once again. So Paul writes this letter, he pens it, and it is so powerful, and it's so helpful, and it's a, tre it's a tremendous reminder to us, again and again, uh, of a number of things. First of all, we're not in a religious sacrificial system any longer. Thank the Lord, we don't have to take some uh, lamb or a goat out of the yard. Some of you have those, but not all of us. And uh, we don't have to take some animal sacrifice and shed the blood of that animal so that every time we sin, that animal can be sacrificed and atoned for our sins. Uh, guess what? We only have one sacrifice now. And that sacrifice is the lamb slain before the foundation of the world, Jesus. And we don't have to slay an animal every time we sin. Jesus Christ already paid that penalty on the cross. And so he is the one and only sacrifice once and for all when he went to the cross and he continues to redeem us ongoing throughout our lives after having shed his blood for us on Calvary. And never again does there need to be another sacrifice for my sins or your sins if our faith and trust has been placed in our Lord and Savior Jesus. What a wonderful thing to know that and to believe that. But that, again, was very different and very new for these Jewish folks. Uh, they did not have to go confess their sins to a high priest any longer. Oh, how different that was. And that high priest was not going to be the one to hear what they had done wrong and then to go in and wash his hands at the laver there in the uh, Old Testament tabernacle or temple type of setup. And he wasn't going to go into the Holy of Holies once a year any longer for them and, and sprinkle blood on the mercy seat, although there are still probably practicings of that. Uh, for those who knew and loved the Lord and who had trusted in him, they were now in the place of the high priest. You see, when we got saved, 
the Lord put us in that same place of the high priest who went into the Holy of Holies where the presence of God dwelt, where the Ark of the Covenant was, and where the blood uh, of the sacrifices was sprinkled. All of that was not necessary any longer after Jesus Christ went to the cross because now we, they, anyone who's trusted in Christ is in that very same place. And we don't just go into the place of the presence of God once a year. We are in the presence of God at all times through the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit, the comforter that God gives. Amen, amen, amen. Now, I know that we probably know that, but this was so groundbreaking to these who had come out of that system that there was some struggling going on. And can I just say, if you're here and you're newly saved or you just have gotten back in the church or maybe it's kind of a, a new thing for you and, uh, and maybe there's some questions that you have and it's, you know, it's kind of this, this thing that's very different, uh, just enjoy that first and foremost because if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. And it should all seem new. And it should seem, to be honest, weird in a good way. Uh, not weird in this strange, unfortunate way, but weird in a way that is, hey, this is different, but it's so good, it's so necessary, it's so needed. Uh, praise the Lord for this difference that he's brought about. So I just say that to help us, because we've had some new people in church recently and some folks who have made professions of faith and, and some people who are considering getting baptized and taking uh, a step of uh, church membership and these types of things, that is exciting, and that's wonderful, and you should embrace those changes and say, okay, amen. But at the same time, just be sober, because it's in those moments that Satan likes to attack. Yes, Thus the reason for the writing of the book of Hebrews. He takes so much time to lay that foundation and then it gets very practical in chapter 10. And as we are reading here, the text that we read, beginning in verse 22, it's almost as though he's saying, now, because of all of that, because of Jesus now being the new system that has brought about the new covenant through the blood of Jesus, and we don't have to be involved or engaged in this old system any longer, now, here's what you need to be doing and how you should be living. Thus, he comes to verse 25, and he, and he capstones it by saying, so much the more. They thought maybe they were already heavily religious people. But Paul's saying, the wonderful thing about the Lord Jesus is, you don't have to do everything, and yet you should want to do everything. Isn't that a good truth about the Christian life? You don't have to do anything to keep your salvation because you're not keeping it anyhow. You don't have to come to church another day in your life to die and go straight to heaven if you place your faith and trust in Jesus. You don't have to do anything. The Lord doesn't require us to do anything. And yet the very essence of the Christian life is, yes, we know, but we want to. We want to do it. No one's telling me that we have to be in church and that we have to read the Word of God. Well, the preacher does say that, but still, you could ignore him and turn your back on what he's saying and go and live the way you want, and you'd still go to heaven if your faith and trust is in Jesus Christ. That's how good God's grace is. And yet we also understand, but we don't want to do that. We don't want to presume upon the grace of God. And because the Lord hasn't required any of these things for us, now we get to do these things and we want to live that life. Well, that's what he's saying here. And he begins in verse 22 by saying, Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Now, the newly saved Jewish people would understand this imagery. What does he say? He talks about our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. That would conjure up the image of the sprinkling of blood. Uh, he says, our bodies washed with pure water. Uh, that would conjure up the image of the high priest washing his hands in the laver uh, before he would go about his duties. And the message is for them because they are in that place of the high priest themselves. So this all applies. And the first practical truth is, let us draw near, number one, so much the more. 
Let us draw near. Where should we draw near to? Well, the Bible says, draw nigh to God, and he will draw near nigh to you. So we begin with that. All of us, as we are considering this theme for 2024, here's what I'm asking of everyone here at Truth Baptist Church. Boy, it seems elementary, but I'm asking you, I'm begging you, I'm, I'm, I'm pleading with you to do this. Let's get closer to God than we've ever been before. Right. Amen? Yeah. Let's get closer to God than we've ever been before. And I think sometimes we try to complicate it. We try to make it more than it is. Uh, we try to, I don't know, we maybe overthink it. Maybe the devil causes us to overanalyze and we don't really do what we should just simply do. And that is open up the word of God and read the word of God. Just do it. Just open up God's Word and read it and begin to follow it and study it and live after it. That's how you draw closer to God. And as you learn of God through His Word, you'll have a desire to want to talk to God. And when you have an issue that arises in your life, uh, don't jump on the phone and, and call Mom right away. And don't jump on the phone and call Dad right away. Now, it's okay to call Mom and Dad. But remember, we have a Heavenly Father who wants to hear everything. And he's, he has the answers. And as well-meaning as good parents can be, sometimes they don't have all the right answers. And don't jump on the phone, and, or, or <laughs> jump on the phone, I'm dating myself. Who jumps on the phone anymore? Uh, don't uh, instant message, here we go, we're a little closer to reality now. Don't instant message your best friend. And uh, don't video shot your, your uh, you know, your acquaintance or the good friend that you just met and tell them about all your problems right away. Listen, there is a God in heaven who loves you and he knows what you're going through and he understands the answers that you need in your life. So draw nigh to God and continue to draw nigh to God more than ever. Let's do that in the year ahead. Let's draw closer to the Lord than we've ever been. Uh, I'm preaching this now at the third week in January because a lot of us maybe have already stopped reading our Bibles. Maybe we started pretty well, maybe that first week or the second week, but maybe we've already started to wane a little bit in that. Uh, let's not complicate the matter. Let's just get in God's Word. Let's just get a truth from God's Word. Let's try to read some verses or some chapters. Uh, let's share some of that truth with our family, and we don't have to complicate that either. One of the most helpful things for me was when we had our family conference this past year in 2023, and uh, I loved it when Dr. David Tice came, and he said, you know, when I, when I got my family together for family devotions, uh, all my kids started joking around. Immediately, I could relate. And he said, they started goofing off. My two older boys were making faces at each other, and I, anything I tried to say went over everyone's head, and uh, it seemed like it wasn't going very well. And he said he tried to really, you know, almost preach a message, try to get deep theological truths across to them. And he realized that didn't go very well. I can remember doing the same thing with my family when I was a younger, a younger man. And I can remember getting them together and trying to, like, you know, share some things with them. And, you know, Trent's four, Nicole's two, and, you know, everything's just whoop, whoop, going right over their head. And, and I just didn't really accurately assess the situation as good as I could have. And then I realized, you know, it's good probably just to share a verse or share a thought and get them to talk about that. Maybe share a thought that God spoke to you about that day and, and, and kind of dwell on that a little bit and talk about that a little bit. And you know what that does? That helps as we talk about spiritual things. And maybe just take a few minutes after dinner or whenever it might be. You know what you're doing when you do that, Dad? You're helping to cause your family to draw nigh to the Lord together as you do the same. That's the first thought. Draw near. And let's draw near so much the more. Here's the second thought. Let us hold fast our profession so much the more. So let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith. Verse 23 says, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. In the Jewish community, those who were still practicing now the defunct false religion of Judaism were working overtime to probably bring people back into the fold, and there were some Jews that actually did that. They would renounce their faith in Christ, they'd renounce their Christianity, they would try to work to go back, and even in chapter 6, it's a very, very interesting chapter in God's Word. It, it confuses some people. 
But Paul makes the point by saying you can't go back and get saved all over again. Uh, if you go back to the old form of Judaism, you're saved once and you're saved forever. Uh, just go on and live for the Lord Jesus Christ. But they were working to get them to come back and to try to add works to their salvation. You know the difference between Christianity and so many other religions today? It's that ours is done. Theirs is due in both senses of the word, D-O and D-U-E. It's about what they do in this life, but it will be due before Jesus, before the Lord one day. I'm glad that it's done, amen? I'm glad that for us it's already been accomplished. So it's already been done, it's already been accomplished on our behalf. We can't work for our salvation. And that's why the Apostle Paul is saying here, hold fast, hold tight onto that profession of your faith and don't waver from it, for he is faithful that promise. Now listen. I've been laying groundwork here because I just want to get some things across to us. When a person gets saved, they are vulnerable. And even for some folks, years after they get saved, they're vulnerable to having doubts about their own standing before the Lord Jesus Christ. Doubts about their profession. And what Paul is saying here is this. When you called out to the Lord in faith, you got saved and you receive the Holy Spirit of God who's now with you at all times, hold on to that and cherish that and, and understand what God did in your life when he did that. Uh, I, in my life, can look back at three major times where I made professions of faith. Let me share with you about it. Because you might be saying, oh, that sounds a little bit like me. <laughs> um, I got saved when I was a boy. And I heard the truth of the gospel, and I accepted it, and in faith I believed it. And I knew that I trusted in Jesus Christ. I knew that without a doubt that I was saved at around five years of age. <clears throat> then I got older, and I got into my teenage years, and I realized that when I was 15, I didn't have the same tender heart that I did when I was five. Something happens to guys when they turn 15. And, uh, and I got a little hardened in some areas. I got a little jaded in some areas. I got... I don't know what it was, tough guy complex or what I thought I needed to be or whatever it was. And, and I really did not seek after the Lord like I had been or like I should have been. And after doing that for about a few years, that created some doubts in my heart until my senior year when God brought about some situations in my life that caused me to repent and come back to the Lord, so to speak, and to really tell the Lord, I'm sorry, I've really been away from you for some time, and even make a second profession of faith. I even got rebaptized a second time. I can remember talking to my pastor about this whole thing, and he said, Eric, I'm so glad that you're wanting to make the right choice to, you know, do what's right now again. I've been praying for you. I've seen it in your life. You really don't need to get baptized again. You've already been baptized. Baptism doesn't save you anyhow. And I said, no, I, pastor, I really want to. And he said, okay, if that's what you want to do, we'll, we'll do that. And, and so we did, and I went ahead and went through the baptistry uh, again, knowing that that didn't save me, but I wanted to be clear to the church. I'm different now. Then I went to college, and I can remember, I think it was my freshman or even my sophomore year, every once in a while, a preacher or an evangelist would come, and they literally scare you out of hell again if you've already been saved. You know how that goes? And if you, you, we've all heard those messages where it doesn't matter how saved you know you are, you feel like you're unsaved and on your way to hell at the end of the message. And I was there at Pensacola Christian College, and I heard this preacher giving that message, and I was at the end of that message, and I was quaking in my boots. And he talked about the awful reality of hell. And I'll tell you, it is an awful reality. To think about continually being burning and living that painful existence of always dying and yet never being dead is just unfathomable. And so you know what I did at the end of that message? I said, Lord, I know I've already made two professions of faith. I'm, I'm certain that I'm saved, but just in case, I'm going to do it again. And I remember going forward, and I prayed, and I asked the Lord to save me if I wasn't. And I talked to some people about that after I made that third profession. And, 
And they brought me to some passages of Scripture that showed me, listen, when you are saved once, you are saved forever. And the Bible tells us that no man can take us out of the hand of God. And the Bible says that Jesus tells us all that the Father gives him, John 6, 37, he will in no wise cast out. And so we can't save ourselves and we can't keep ourselves saved. So what do we do? Just know that if we've confessed the Lord Jesus Christ and we, and we in faith called upon the Lord, you're saved. And, and just hold on to that. Now, I can't give you that confidence. But you, if you know that you've trusted in Jesus, understand that you're saved. As I look back on my whole life, I realized I was saved as a boy. I got baptized at one time and, uh, after I got saved, and, and that was good to do. But I didn't need to make additional professions, although sometimes, you know what, as humans, we're weak and we want to. And maybe you've made multiple professions. Well, I'm glad that you have a heart that cares enough to want to make more professions. But if you have the heart that wants to do that, that's a great evidence that you're saved. If your heart is pricked enough when you hear truth about salvation that you say, well, I... You know, I've not, I didn't do everything I should have done this week. Lord, I just I want to make sure that I'm, I'm saved. Can you save me if I'm not saved? That's not what you have to do. But what you should do is you should come to the Lord and say, Lord, I know that I'm saved. I know that I've trusted in you. I know my faith is in you. I've already made that decision clear. But I'm sorry for where I've wronged you. Isn't that sweet? When you have a moment of apology or a moment of kind of reconciliation with someone that you love. And either they tell you that you're, they're sorry or you tell them that you're sorry and then there's a forgiveness that's uh, given and, and what was not right before is made right again. Maybe there's a breach between us and the Lord and maybe you heard the first point and you said, I want to draw near the Lord, Pastor. I want to draw near so much the more in this year ahead, but I don't feel like I'm close to God at all. I don't even know where to begin. Well, maybe we just need to get back to where we were when we first got saved. And come to God in faith again and say, Lord, I know that you've saved me, but I want to be right by you. I want to reestablish and I want to re reconcile fellowship. Because notice, our salvation is the basis for everything in the Christian life. And the Apostle Paul was saying, don't waver. Don't waver in what you know to be true. You've trusted in Christ. That's the basis for all that you do in Christianity and what you believe. Here's the third thought. Let us consider one another so much the more. Look at verse 24. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. I want to say this, and I want to be careful to say it clearly. We all, excuse me, we are a community of believers. The church is a called out assembly. And therefore, we are to conduct our Christian lives in community. That means that we are together in this thing. We're doing this as a group. We're doing this together. And I like that because it brings about a, a real synergy. We consider one another, not just ourselves. Do you know that you're responsible for helping others in their walk with the Lord? You're not just responsible for yourself. And if you're someone who cares about doing things as God has instructed us, and you love the Lord, you'll want to help others in their walk. You'll want to consider them. And know what the Bible says there? It says to provoke. Now that word provoke usually has a negative connotation, doesn't it? And uh, I think of a, a sibling trying to provoke their other siblings. Every family has a provoker. Right now, you, if you're the provoker, you know it's you. And, uh, or if you're not, you're looking at the provoker right now. Yeah, yeah. And every family has it. And there's that provoker that when everything's just peaceful, it's a little too peaceful. I need to, I need to flick someone's ear, you know? Or I need to give them a wet willy. Or I don't like how nice and calm everything seems. Uh, let's, let's stir the pot. When we were growing up, ironically, it was my brother Ben. He did not like peace. He wanted everything to be disrupted. And if there, were, if there was calmness or quietness, boy, he was going to make a problem somewhere. There's, this is the strangest thing about my brother Ben. 
Now he's exactly the opposite. I don't know what happened, but he became an adult, and now he's the, kind, the kindest, calmest, quiet. He, he's, just a, he's just a great guy. And we all have said to ourselves, what happened to the Ben we knew when you were that wild little guy? See, there's hope for those ones who are wild and crazy when they're young. They might actually turn out to be wonderful adults one day. But I'm telling you, you know who that provoker is. Well, listen, this is not the connotation of the word here, although in a sense it is. We are to provoke one another, that is, to stir up. So the meaning of the word here is to stir up. Okay, that sounds similar. Stir the pot, but not in a negative way, but in a positive way. Because we are to stir one another up, notice, unto love and to good works. Do you know that it's easier to provoke negatively than it is to provoke positively? It's easier to cause a disruption in a negative sense because we're humans and we're sinful and in a way it almost comes natural to us. It's easy to cause trouble and disunity in the church as opposed to causing unity in the church. It's easy to bring about problems and strife as compared to bringing about healing and reconciliation and help and encouragement and love and good works. But with the help of the Lord, we can do it. And we should be so exhorting and helping and provoking one another to love and to good works that when we see it taking place in our midst, we should say, you know, I see that brother so-and-so. He's always an encouragement. He's always, you know, lifting people up. He's always just got that word of encouragement. And, and you know what? I want to be the same way. Uh, you see these flowers up here. These, uh, these represent... Uh, Darnell Pierce and uh, these are the flowers that we gave on behalf of his memory I had the opportunity to preach his funeral yesterday not all of you knew Darnell maybe some of you did but he came to our church for just a couple years and uh, and then right as he was about to join uh, he got cancer and COVID came kind of all at the same time um, but you know it was a sweet homegoing service that we had for him yesterday and uh, one of the things about him was that he was a man's man. He was a strong guy. Uh, he lo I mean, he was 87 years old when he died. Uh, but he, I mean, he loved to go out and fish and catch big fish and clean them up. And uh, he loved tinkering around with engines and, and zero-turn mowers and riding them and just being an outdoors kind of guy. And yet he was a gentle guy also, as far as my experience with him was. And I can remember when he came, he had a presence about him. He kind of came in almost kind of like a, he had a cane with him, and he sat down, but he kind of looked like a seasoned John Wayne, you know? And he sat down with his cane, he looked at him, he just had a presence about him, just this presence. And, I, and sometimes guys like that, you, you, you know, as a young preacher especially, you think, oh boy, is this guy going to be good or is he going to cause some issues? And he never caused a single issue. Everything he said to me was encouraging. Uh, as we learned about him going to be with the Lord, Heather digged up an old, or dug up uh, an old uh, Christmas card that he sent to us. And it was the sweetest card uh, that he could have sent to us. And he wrote a personal message in there about, uh, Pastor, you and your family, something along the lines have been such a, an example, an encouragement, and a blessing. This is coming from a guy who wrote all the things he wrote to us. And I, I was so encouraged to see that letter again. I didn't realize we still had that. And, uh, and I think about that kind of guy. And you know what? Uh, when I preach these funerals and I hear these things being said about these people that live those testimonies, my first thought is, well, I better start making sure I'm living right so that there's some nice things said about me when it's my time to have a funeral. And you do think about that. I want some people to show up, first of all, and then I hope some people have some nice things to say, secondly. But I also think of his testimony as a man who did this very thing provoked unto love and to good works use any kind of influence or presence that you have not to disrupt but to build up stir people up not in a bad way but to be encouraged to do something great for god 
when you see people who've lived that life and that testimony and they're loving and they do good works and they're not doing it so that they can be seen of men, but so that they can simply serve God with their life, you know what it does? It makes me say, I want to be just like that. I want to be that same way. And I don't want the devil to get in and cause some disruption and cause me to become jaded or cause me to say, oh, you know, that's not worth it or what's the point or what's the use or why serve God anyway? And look at our world, it's all going to pot and, you know, Christians aren't the way they used to be. And listen, I've heard it all and I've said a lot of it. I don't want to be that way though. I want to be the guy who builds up. I want to provoke and stir to love and to good works. That's so much better. And that's exactly what God's told us to be biblically. Fourth and finally, let us not forsake the assembling, but exhort one another so much the more. Verse 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. And some of you right now might be thinking, here he goes. Ah, we knew this was coming. He's a preacher. He wants us all here all the time. So now here it comes. No, I promise you that's not what I'm trying to do. But if it does mean that you're in church more, well, praise the Lord for it. Because all of us are good at excusing ourselves right out of this place. I'm just telling you. I am good at coming up with excuses for why I don't do what I don't want to do. And I will be honest, I'm the pastor, so I have to be here. But there has probably been more than a few Sundays where I could excuse myself right out of here if I wasn't the pastor. So I get it. I'm human too. I can come up with plenty of good reasons. Sometimes I come in here and I feel like I don't even want to preach today. <laughs> no. Yeah. Yeah, I do. And some of us didn't want to get out of bed this morning. I know it because I had a house full of them that didn't want to. <laughs> it's just the way we are. And, and, and the spirit is willing sometimes, but the flesh is weak. But I will tell you and guarantee you that if we come together with the people of God, it, it does something. It helps us. And your presence encourages someone else. And that's why it tells us, don't forsake the assembling of ourselves together. Can I encourage us in the year 2024? Don't try to find a reason not to be here. But get here and find a reason to be here and serve here and exhort others while you're here and allow God to use you while you are here, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. Some do. And some find a reason not to come and they don't want to be here all the time. Uh, there was a door-to-door -door survey that was done by a large church in a community up in the Midwest some time ago and they, they asked a number of questions as to if you don't go to church, why don't you go? And here were the five biggest reasons. Number five, I feel awkward at church. So remember that when someone walks in here for the first time. It, it might have taken everything they have just to walk through the doors here. Let's not make it any more difficult for them. They should be loved on. They should be encouraged. They should be welcomed. And they should know that they're in a place that's very friendly and helpful and encouraging to them. Number four, I'm too busy already. Well, we're all as busy as we've ever been, aren't we? Number three, uh, it's irrelevant. And we have to consider that. I don't want to become a dinosaur or a fossil of a place where we're irrelevant to the community in which we live. Let's balance relevancy and let's balance contextualization by still remaining true to God's word and yet being able to reach people where they are in the day and times in which we live. Uh, and then number one, the greatest reason as to why people don't go to church is they said because it's boring. <laughs> well, if it's boring, then we need to change that, don't we? Because I can guarantee you this, God's not boring. And there's nothing about God or the people of God that should ever be boring. So... I take this to heart. I don't want my messages to be boring. I want them to be engaging. And he, I've heard this said before. Usually, uh, bored people are kind of boring themselves. You know, if you're always bored all the time, maybe you're the boring one. And so, let's work on that. Don't come in here with a countenance that's kind of like, okay, I'm here again. Church. 
but come in and say, hey, how are you, brother? How are you, sister? Oh, it's good to see you again. How's, how's your leg doing? Or how's, you know, that cough coming along? I haven't heard you cough for a few weeks. That's great. You know, please keep it that way or, you know, whatever it is. <laughs> Just find a way to, to talk and encourage and be a blessing. There was an old preacher, and he noticed that one of his parishioners was not in church and had suddenly fallen out. And so the call went out for this fellow to come visit this old preacher. And this preacher had been at it for a long time, preached at the same church for decades, years and years. And the man came in and he said, hey, pastor so-and-so. He said, hey, how are you? Have a seat right here. And it was a very cold day. We've had some of those these last few days, haven't we? And he said, sit down with me by the wood stove and by the fire here where we can be warm. That's all the preacher said. And the parishioner was there kind of looking at him, and the preacher kind of just kept looking at the fire. And then it became a little awkward, and he was wondering to himself, what's going on here? I know I've missed church. What's he about to do? Is he going to throw me in? What's happening here? And then suddenly, that old preacher leaned forward. He took the fire poker, and he saw one of the pieces of wood that was about to fall apart, and he kind of broke a piece off and he took that hot ember, that hot coal and he just moved it away from the rest of the fire. And he kind of rested his hands on the poker. He looked over at the fella and looked at the coal. And looked at him again and the coal started to lose its glow. It started to lose its heat. It started to lose its vibrancy and before long it kind of became black and ashy. And after a great while, that parishioner looked at his old preacher, and he got the point. And he said, Preacher, I'll be back to church on Sunday. I'll tell you something. If you remove yourself from the body, it has an effect. Yes, and you don't want to do that because you'll lose all that God is doing in you. You see, sometimes we think, well, I'm going to be here, and I'm going to be the blessing that this church needs. So I'll go so I can be the blessing. Oh, no, you'll also be blessed yourself. And you'll receive everything that you need. You might not get every point of the message, but there's going to be something that helps you. You uh, might feel like you didn't really do much by being there, but there's a brother and sister who saw you, and they saw the way that you conducted yourself, and they were helped and encouraged by the way you conducted yourself in church, and that helped them go on for the rest of the week. We need each other. The church has been established in community and so as we think about the year ahead let's not forsake the assembling of ourselves together let's not be finding reasons to get out let's not be finding reasons to scale back or to say I don't want to be involved but let's say no I'm going to do even more so much the more I'm not finding a reason to quit and fall out but I'm finding a reason more than ever to do more than I ever can I, you know, I, I'm not going to put a definition on that. But I'll tell you, as this church moves forward, we need more people to step up. And we need more folks to say, for me, it's not going to be so much less, but it's going to be so much the more. Oh, my God, convict us about that. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes together. So much the more. This was a message to our people. This is a message to Christians. I want to ask you, would you be willing to say, in the year ahead, I'll, I see the need and I'm going to be involved so much the more. I'm going to be in church so much the more, not so much less. I'm going to be involved in a part of things so much more. You see that... The verse ends with that thought, so much the more, and I didn't have the time to expound upon it, but as we see the day approaching, Christ is coming back. Either that or we're leaving before he comes back. We're going to die at some point. So let's not shrivel back in these days. Let's do so much the more as we see that day of the Lord coming. And I don't know what that means for you, but you know, how can you be more involved? What service can you add to the list? 
What meeting time have you missed out on that you say, you know, I, I can come back to that meeting time of God's people. I can be back in connection class again. I, we fell out. It's time to get back in. I can be back on Sunday night again, and I can hear about the calendar for the year and be excited about what's planned. I, 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 can, I can see the opportunity to be back. Wednesday night, I'm going to bring my kids, and I'm going to be here. I, I, I've not been some time in the middle of the week, but I'm going to come back. So much the more. What else, what other areas need attending to? Maybe it's getting in the word of God, so much the more. Maybe it's just sharing our testimony and our faith and holding fast the profession of that faith, so much the more. Let's ask God to show us. and Let's respond as he does. Father, I ask that you'd speak to our hearts this morning. We are to be so much the more believers. We don't find a reason not to do what you've told us to do. We've gotten too good at that. But I pray, Lord, that we would honestly seek how we can do what you want us to do and increase our faithfulness, increase our dedication, increase our love and our passion for you. We can't fabricate this. We can't just make this happen falsely. It'll, it, it'll fail before it even starts. But Lord, if we do gain a real desire, according to your word, to do so much the more, oh, it'll be wonderful to see what you do so much the more in our own lives. Help us with these things. Encourage us now. Show us what we need to know. Speak in this moment of invitation, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me, please, quietly where you are? So much the more. I didn't take time to emphasize it, but if you've never trusted in Jesus Christ, it would be the greatest decision you've ever made. I'd love to talk to you right now about what that means. Or whatever else it might be, as the piano plays, when I ask Holly to play a verse or two of invitation, would you come, would you pray, let's ask the Lord for so much the more. In the year 2024, not so much less, not, not give me out of this if I can, let me find something else to do, let me find something else to be involved in, but let's so much the more do what God wants for us. Would you come? Would you pray? Let's ask God for that help this morning. Amen. Well, thank you for being here this morning, and uh, I hope you have a wonderful afternoon. Hope you stay warm wherever you are. Come back tonight. Look forward to being back at the 6 o'clock hour. We'll, we'll give out some calendars for the year, and we'll kind of look at the year ahead and be excited about what God has planned for us as a church.
and I hope you'll be back for that. We dismiss now in a word of prayer. Uh, Brother Neil Atkinson, would you dismiss us, please?